this evening, uh, I'm going to have a conversation with Andrew McGregor Marshall on a country not often discussed in global politics or on global television networks, and yet a quite significant country in Southeast Asia, the Kingdom of Thailand. Andrew Marshall's book is titled A Kingdom in Crisis, and it's an account he began researching and working on when he was in Thailand as a Reuters correspondent, as we'll discuss uh, in a minute. Thailand emerged on the global stage during the Vietnam War when the United States wanted a secure country in the region, and eight military bases were constructed in Thailand for rest and recreation, so that people, American soldiers, tired of fighting in Vietnam, were brought to the safety and beauty of Thailand. That was the rest. The recreation was prostitution on a large scale. Subsequently, a country of 26 million, with 80% concentrated in agriculture, was transformed into a country in the late 80s and 90s of 60 million with a huge manufacturing output based on garments and textiles and with a thriving economy. So you had the emergence of new tycoons, uh, building media empires, political parties, fighting each other, but at the top of this pyramid was the royal family and in particular the king. So, Andrew, let's start sure. <clears throat> with the monarchy. There's a very interesting quote in your book uh, from an uh, English diplomat who wrote A History of Siam, in which he says that the, and you write, blood-curdling punishments were inflicted on those who transgressed Les Majesty, mm. who insulted the monarch. You explain this? Well, I think your introduction was, was very pertinent um, because, as you mentioned, Thailand is rarely discussed. The main reason for that is there's a Les Majesté law which criminalizes any honest discussion about the monarchy. And this law is stretched so far that it's actually used to prevent anybody seeing anything truthful other than just random hagiography. Um, but the sex industry in Thailand and the monarchy, although they're opposite poles of the social spectrum, they're intimately connected for two reasons. The first is that they're both products of a grossly hierarchical society where the powerful and the rich can really do whatever they want to people below them on the social scale. And so we see a lot of people who have no education and no wealth, a lot of women and men, working in the sex industry because it's the only way they can really make a living, and that's tragic. Um, and that is generated by this massive social inequality that's symbolized by the presence of a vastly wealthy monarchy. The second reason the monarchy and the sex industry are connected are because they're both taboo subjects that you're not supposed to talk about in Thailand. How did you break the law? Well, back in 2011, I was working for Reuters. I'd been with them for 17 years. And I was becoming increasingly uneasy that Reuters and all the international media, we were censoring ourselves. We weren't talking about the rule of the monarchy and what's happening in Thailand's crisis. And we weren't talking about the royal succession. And the reason for that is the Les Majesté law. But what amazed me and troubled me was that nobody was really challenging it. And you know, Thailand is not a hugely powerful country. People can write what they want about China and North Korea, and of course they might get expelled from the country, but in general, the international media try their best, with some exceptions, to report on these countries. But in Thailand, they tended just to ignore these aspects because they didn't want to cause trouble. So that really troubled me as a journalist. I thought it's our duty to tell the truth, and if we're not going to tell the truth, we at least have to say in every story that we can't tell the truth mm -hmm. because the law forbids it but they weren't prepared to do that. 
So I got hold of some of the uh, WikiLeaks cables on Thailand before they were in the public domain. And they were fascinating because it was one of the few times we'd seen experts on Thailand, because whatever you think about them, the US State Department diplomats in Thailand, they were experts of in the course. country. And experts on Thailand talking without self-censorship about the Thai monarchy, it's raw, it's fascinating because you've never seen that before. So of all the countries in the world that I could have focused on when I had access to these documents, I chose Thailand. And I started writing an analysis about the WikiLeaks cables. Um, Reuters forbade me to continue because they said it was too dangerous for their staff in the country and they didn't want to break for this Majesty law. I thought it was important for this to be published, so I resigned in 2011 um, and I published it online myself. And that was the point I officially broke the law in Thailand. So I became unemployed and a criminal. Uh, I haven't been back to Thailand since. Um, since then, um, I was working on various articles about Thailand and this book, which I published a few months ago. Since the book had been formal, the book was banned in Thailand as an affront to national security and morals. And there's also been a formal complaint against me. Um, I've been accused of breaking the Les Majesty law, which has up to 15 years in jail. I've also been accused of uh, fomenting an uprising in Thailand, which has the potential death penalty. So I, I'm not worried, I think. I, I, I'm never going to go back to face these charges. But it's interesting that there's been such a violent reaction about just trying to tell the true story of Thai history. How do you explain the fact that given the control of the royal family and the fact that the Thai constitution uh, actually gives the royal family a leading role in the country and as being an essential part mm -hmm. of democracy, why haven't we yet witnessed, I mean, uh, let's say a 1789, a mm. French revolutionary mm. type of outburst by the peasants and the more intelligent players in urban society mm. to get rid of the system? What explains the control? Could it be religion? I, I think that's part of the answer, but I think the main answer is that Thai royalism, ro Thai royalism is a religion in itself. Mm. When Thais grow up from their earliest childhood, they're brainwashed into believing that their king, who we can see behind us, is a godlike figure. Um, he can do no wrong. Everything good that's ever happened to Thailand has come through the monarchy. And people are taught this really from birth. Uh, and many of them believe it because every evening on Thai television, there's royal news. It's an hour of propaganda showing all the great things the royals have done. And so this, I think, has really changed the way many Thais think. And uh, a lot of historians are, and, and political commentators on Thailand would say there's a personality cult. So, that, so that's a key aspect of this. Many, many Thais have become convinced that the king is a figure of great goodness. And because of the Les Majesty law that forbids any critical discussion, there's no counter-narrative. But I think the, the challenge that you mentioned from the poor and from the urban intelligentsia, I think we've seen that building since 2005. That's one of the reasons Thailand is in so much turmoil now, because the poor have finally started to start asserting their rights. And also a lot of the urban intellectuals are, are disgusted by these restrictions on freedom of speech. So they're starting to move. So, so we're seeing things beginning to change. But I think one reason it didn't happen in Thailand until now, which is uh, very important, uh, which Benedict Anderson has mentioned in his studies, is that Thailand was never formally colonized. Yes. So there was never a nationalist movement that swept away the old power structures. The old power structures have always stayed in place. And it's very hard for a lot of Thais who have been brainwashed throughout their lives to distinguish pride in their country from support of the monarchy. The monarchy is kind of regarded as identical to the country, which of course is nonsense because the monarchy in fact has acted like a colonial power within Thailand. It's in that sense, it's not so dissimilar to what the Japanese king used to be like prior to the Second World War. I mean, worshipped mm. almost as a god, not allowed to be seen, mm. not allowed to be criticized, 
World War II, of course, changed all yes. that. The Americans could have dumped Hirohito, mm. but they were scared of uh, socialists and communists taking the country, so they kept him mm. in power. I mean, you, you sometimes feel, is there anything short of a war <laughs> that will get rid of the Thai monarchy? Um, a lot of people in Thailand who I know who are involved in the red shirt movement, which is the main anti-monarchist and pro-democracy movement, many of them believe that only violent conflict would work to uh, change what's happening in Thailand because the elite are so entrenched and so powerful. As a foreign journalist, I don't think it's my place to advocate violent struggle in Thailand. Um, but I think the best thing that we can do is just to tell the truth about Thailand because it's never properly been done. I think there are two, tr two huge changes that are going to, I hope, change Thailand for the better. The first is that in the 21st century, information is much more free. So however much the Thais attempt to shut down my book and shut down the, the comments of other exiled scholars, they can't. The second is that the royal succession is imminent. And when that happens, it will change everything because the crown prince is, is hated in Thailand. Um, he doesn't have the same kind of support that the king has. So I hope that these two factors will bring about change without violence. But let's, let's talk about the Crown Prince. Mm. Is this the only possibility, or could he be sort of pushed aside by the current king and another relative found to succeed mm. on the throne? Well, throughout Thai history, every time there's a royal succession, it's a time of immense uh, machinations and tension and usually violent conflict. And I don't think this time is any different, and that's one of the themes of my book. I think a lot of the Thai elite are trying to freeze out the crown prince and prevent him from becoming king. The reason is that the Thai monarchy is immensely wealthy. It controls a fortune that's conservatively estimated at about $35 billion, and a more realistic estimate would probably double that. So the monarch controls this money. And what terrifies a lot of the Thai elite about the Crown Prince is that he's a slightly troubled individual. He can't be controlled. The current king, in many ways, has been a stooge of the elite. He does what he's told, and he never really asserted himself. But the Crown Prince is a loose cannon, and the thought of him in charge of all the royal money and possibly in alliance with the exiled former Thai Prime Minister Taksin Shinawat that terrifies the Thai elite. So in my analysis of the conflict we've seen in Thailand since 2005, a lot of it is, part, is a secret succession struggle, which is going on amongst the elite. That shouldn't hide the fact that the big struggle in Thailand is a struggle by ordinary people for democracy and equal rights. And I've been accused with some justice of, of focusing too much on the elite and the monarchy. The reason I do that is because nobody else is able to do it without being banned. But I just want to make clear the big struggle in Thailand is ordinary people who need equal rights and democracy and to get out of this hierarchical society that constrains them. Well, I think you're absolutely right to do so because mm. the two aren't unrelated. Exactly. I mean, often huge struggles within the elite and clashes, either violent or non-violent mm. clashes within the elite, opens up a completely new space of forces from below. Now, I come to this subject as a journalist, not as an academic, which is a strength and a weakness. But I think the strength is that I'm just looking for explanations. And I think for many people around the world, when they look at the crisis in Thailand since 2005 and the battle between the red shirts and the yellow shirts and all these convulsions and coups that we've seen, they find it very hard to understand what's yeah. going on. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. And in my view, the reason for that is because a key part of the story has been banned from being told, that story of the succession struggle. And I think that when you put the succession struggle back into the story, you can suddenly understand what the elite are doing. You can understand who have been desperately trying to bring down government after government since 2005. And so it's a key part of the story. That, that doesn't mean that, you know, history is only about looking at the elite, but given the power and wealth of these people, obviously their actions have a huge impact on Thailand, and we have to provide an explanation for them. So that's what I tried to do. But explain a bit what 
are the differences between the elite, which mm. are reflected in these huge fights mm. between political parties, uh, basically elite political parties, <coughs> fighting for support from the poor. Mm. Uh, Thaksin has been discredited mm. and is in exile and is in league with the crown prince. His opponents are in power. Um, what is the role of the army going to be in the succession? Well, the army are more pragmatic than many of the old royalist elite, but they really only care about themselves and their own power. And they're terrified of democracy and the power of the people, as are the old elite. And this is the reason for the convulsions that we've seen in Thailand since 2005, because for all his faults, Taksin actually implemented policies that helped the poor. In both the country the, yes, side. Yes, in the country, also the urban poor, but especially in the countryside. And he was corrupt. He was, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's th th there's many reasons to, to criticize him, but it's undeniable that he did more for the ordinary people of Thailand than many, or probably than anybody's done before. So of course he loved among the, the rural poor. Um, and this terrifies the old elite because in the old times, Thai politics was just about, you know, if, if you were one of the elite, you could basically buy your own votes. Uh, you could set your own agenda, and suddenly Taksin has changed that. And that's, I think, what we're seeing in Thailand. We're seeing a real struggle to the death between an old, dying oligarchy that's monopolized power actually for centuries and has imposed this hierarchical society and this fake idea of Thainess, which means that you're supposed to be deferential to your superiors and, and quiet, and you're not supposed to challenge any of these ideas. And we're seeing that being challenged by the power of the poor through the ballot box. We're seeing it being challenged by people able to discuss things on the internet for the first time openly. Because even 10 or 20 years ago, there were still dissidents, but it was you had to circulate underground texts. It was much more difficult to circulate information. But now it's freely available online. And people like me are on Facebook and Twitter and sharing this information. So uh, I think it's a, a, a real crunch time for Thailand. Um, it's a very medieval re regime that's managed to survive until the modern day, and it's now confronted with modernity and the aspirations of ordinary people. And that's, I think, why the Thai elite have become dangerous, because they can see that this is a losing struggle, and they're desperately trying to hang on to something that's really been lost. And that's why this has been so bloody and so dangerous in the past few years. Okay. Well, in your book, you discuss in some detail how dissent was crushed in mm. the 70s mm. when, when I made my trip to Thailand to speak at mm. Thammasat University. Um, and certainly, I could see with my own eyes the ferment, the huge influence of the Vietnamese struggle yes. on students, a desire by some to take up guerrilla warfare mm. to bring down this regime. And then in 76, the student movement was brutally crushed. Brutally crushed. There was massacres, thousands mm. were killed, and an effective dictatorship yes. uh, was installed. In terms of building something progressive, something on the left of society, which offers real hope of social change, is there any such organization today, even in the underground? It's, it's a good question, and there's no easy answers. The red shirt movement, um, which is loyal mostly to Taksin Shinawat, the exiled former prime minister, it has quite progressive principles in terms of freedom of speech. It's mostly made up of the rural poor, and they tend to want progressive change, but at the same time, they're putting a lot of their faith in Taksin, who's a corrupt, frankly rather Oligarch. dictatorial figure yeah. and Texan's actually quite royalist in his own way his, his royalism is just a bit different from the rest of the elite because he's more prepared to accept the crown prince so i think the biggest change that we need to see in thailand is for ordinary people to start understanding that it's not about looking for a leader it's about entrenching the power of ordinary people through democracy and the rule of law and these are two things that have been abused throughout Thai history, including modern history. There's no real rule of law. There's been never a real democracy. 
And so the poor, if they go to court, they'll always lose to the rich. At election time, governments are always controlled by oligarchs, and if they're not, there's a coup. And so democracy and the rule of law are stunted. And rather than looking for a movement or a person to make Thailand better, I think we need to focus on entrenching democracy and the rule of law however we can. But it's not so easy. No. Because unless you have some political movement, some social movement to push for that, mm. I mean, that's what we've seen in... Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, the Bolivarian republics of South America that we are now beginning to see uh, in Greece and Spain, mm. in Europe. What, what I, I wanted to ask you was, are there even clusters or groups of students, young intellectuals, people in the cities who know what's going on in the world and prepared to use some of these experiences to help out their own country? There certainly are. I mean, since the coup in May, we've seen a lot of brave students arrested. Um, the, the junta implemented a lot of ludicrous policies. They, they banned any gathering of more than five people. So some students started having picnics where they just sat eating sandwiches together. They were arrested for eating sandwiches with political intent. Um, we they was say that again? They were arrested were for arrested. eating sandwiches with political intent because they were having a picnic of more than five people as a way to mock the junta's efforts to ban gatherings of more than five people, and they were arrested. Uh, we've seen people being arrested for reading George Orwell's 1984 in public. That's regarded as another sign of protest and dissent, so they get arrested. Um, people start using the salute from the Hunger Games movie, where people do this as a sign of a pro-democracy sign. They get arrested. So we've seen a lot of students in Bangkok and the urban centers doing this, and, and that's a very positive step. And also in the past 10 or 15 years, with the rise of social media, we've seen Thais discussing these things online and publicly, which they could never do before. But I think if we talk about leaders and, and people who transform a regime, I think Taksin has played a huge part in this, despite all his flaws, because <coughs> even though he was highly corrupt, and I don't think he really realized the changes he was creating in Thailand, he's caused a huge political awakening amongst the poor in Thailand, who've learned the power of their votes for the first time, and for the first time have also become enraged that they're votes are being taken away from them when there's a military coup. So for all his faults, I think Taksin, if we take a long view in centuries to come and look back, I think he'll be recognized as somebody that catalyzed change that was long overdue in Thailand. Change which he can't deliver himself. Indeed. Because of his own social and class position. Exactly. And the fact that he is one of the richest men in the country. He certainly was. His, a He's lot of his not. money has been seized. But exactly, he, he is really part of the old elite. And so this is why I think these two struggles fit together. There's an elite struggle over royal succession, which Taksin was a part of because he was allied with the crown prince. And Taksin wanted to put the crown prince on the throne. And the pair of them could have really immense influence in Thailand because um, Taksin has the votes, the crown prince has the money, Together, they could dominate Thailand for a generation or more. So I think Taksin's motivations were actually very self-serving, yeah. and he really just wanted to make himself the preeminent uh, politician in Thailand. But as a side effect of what he's done, he's unleashed all these social forces that are very interesting and hopefully will bring about change. But change, Andrew, if we go back to what we were discussing at the start of the moment, requires really ending the monarchy, democratizing uh, Thailand mm. uh, uh, properly. A start could be the attempt, funnily enough, by forces hostile to Taksin to prevent the crown prince taking mm. over. That, I would have thought, would create a huge crisis. I think so. I, I think in, it's in, quite in likely. the country. But mm. what you haven't told us is who would the elite currently ruling put in the place of the Crown Prince, what are the possibilities? Who else is there? Well, the, 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 one of the Crown Prince's sisters called Princess Sirenthorn, she's immensely popular around Thailand, and she's probably the, the most popular royal after the king. 
but she's in her uh, 50s. Uh, she's never married. She has no heirs. So it's kind of a dead end for, for if the royal family want to choose her. But there are suggestions that she would be made regent on behalf of one of the prince's sons. The, the prince has, oh. has sons from several different marriages. So there's a su suggestion that they'll try and skip the prince. They'll pay him off, um, put one of his sons on the throne, but the son will be so young that they'll have no real so independent influence. And the, and the princess will be able to be regent and rule behind the scenes, which means the elite will still keep control of the money and the royal fortune, which is what they really want. But I, I think the bigger and more important point, I, I absolutely agree with you that until this um, reverence for the monarchy and for social hierarchy ends, it'll be very hard for Thailand to move forward. But when the current king dies, there's no way the monarchy can keep its current reverence. How old is Whoever, he? He's 86 and he's, he's on his deathbed. And even if it's the princess who comes next or whoever it is, the monarchy will never be the same again. There's no way they can maintain the same power and respect after the current king dies because the current king, for all his faults, he has managed to win the love of many of his people. And there's no other figure who can do that in Thailand. And when he dies, even of royalist Thais I know, they're not really royalist, they just love the king. And when he dies, many of them are willing to see real change happening. So we're coming to a real turning point in Thai history, and that's what makes it so interesting. Let's just discuss Buddhism for a mm. bit. <coughs> because after all, this country was called Siam mm. uh, for a long, long time till the military took over and made sure it was called Thailand, That's which right. actually uh, privileges the Thai majority, but forgetting that there are many minorities here. Exactly, it's a nationalist term. It's a, it was a nationalist mm. thing to do. <coughs> Backed by the monasteries, mm. and some of these Buddhist monks, I mean, the image of Buddhism in the West is that they are all sort of semi-hippies, which mm. is why Hollywood uh, so many Hollywood stars and directors become uh, Buddhists. They have mm. no idea what Buddhism is when it's practiced politically in either Thailand or Sri Lanka, mm. where they've been even worse. Yeah. So what is, in your opinion, the influence of Buddhism and the monasteries in, in Thailand today? Well, I think one of the key points is that the influence is declining as religion everywhere outside the Islamic world tends to be declining and we see that in Thailand. The, there's very um, cogent arguments that would say that Buddhism has, has restricted or Thai Buddhism and Sri Lankan Buddhism have restricted political progress because it teaches people to expect rewards of a next life rather than this life. People are taught that their place in, in the social scale is preordained by their karma and that if they live a good life without challenging things, they might be reborn higher up in the next life. So there's an argument that, that Buddhism in Thailand has, has contributed to this lack of change because it teaches people to be passive rather than active in pursuit of political change. On the other hand, a lot of monks are actually read these days in the terms of Thailand's political divisions. A lot of monks, because they come from the villages and the rural areas in most cases, um, and they really believe in equality. And there's always been a tension in Thailand between the religion of the monarchy, which is, as I said earlier, almost like a religion, and Buddhism. <coughs> so I think, I think the role of the monks in Thailand is, is, is it's a double-edged sword. It does some good and some bad. Rather like in Burma, where we've seen the monks fighting for democracy, but also crushing Muslims in the well, West. Well, exactly. It's, 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 and it's in Sri Lanka, ambivalent, yeah. where the Buddhist monks mm. actually were very vicious and exactly. fundamentalist. Some of them are. And, uh, you know, organizing massacres of Tamils. Mm. Now other minorities, are, uh, they're being attacked. So it's a religion. I mean, different yeah. from others, but plays a role. Uh, in, in these mm. societies, which is not often discussed. I, I agree it plays an important <coughs> role, but I think in Thailand, the role of Buddhism is eclipsed by this other religion, monarchy. which is the religion of monarchy, which is, as I said, it almost is religion, and frankly, Les Majesty law is really a blasphemy law. Uh, we come to an end. A Kingdom in Crisis is published by Z Books, and its subtitle is Thailand's Struggle for Democracy in the 21st century.
Andrew, thanks very much. Thank you very much.